Okay. All right. Well, welcome to Baking in Security uh, with Ghost Nomad. That's me. Um, I'm on Twitter, so if you want to follow me on Twitter. Uh, a lot of times I'll talk about baking. Sometimes I talk about security. A lot of times I talk about being a father. So I'm just kind of a mishmash of whatever. Um, but today, <coughs> I want to talk about baking in security. This is a phrase that we use a lot. You hear it a lot in the infosec world. We need to bake in security. We need to get it in the, the development life cycle and all this stuff. But what does baking in security really mean? And so um, to introduce myself, I usually use a tag cloud that has all the words that describe me. But for this, I wanted to go a little bit different and kind of describe the journey that got me to the baking part and how that relates back to security. So. So here I am baking. This is very crudely drawn stick figures. I do apologize. But this is baking. This is where I'm at right now. But how did I get here? And so as a kid, I think most of us found some technology um, that we decided we wanted to, to, to get into that brought us into security. And of course, there was the first computer that I ever saw. Well, OK, this might be a bit of an exaggeration of the com first computer I ever saw, but I was trying to get a point across. I'm not quite that old. That's probably more like the first computer I ever saw. Um, and so seeing those computers, playing with them, it really got me wanting to do more with it. My father had uh, one of the TIs that you plugged into your TV, and it had the cassette tape, and, and you plugged in the giant cartridges. That was my first experience with computer. And it kind of went on to the Commodore 64, and then my grandfather had a 8086 and on up. Um, and so I did. I just really liked working with computers. And then in high school and all through college, I had to find a way to pay for college. And so I went into uh, construction. I did a lot of ripping apart buildings so somebody else could build them. And then I got into some of the carpentry. I spent most of my time doing the, the painting, finished painting, fixing all the drywall mistakes, those types of things, which ended up leading me to getting a degree. Now, when I first went to college, I'm like, I want to do computers, because that's what I've always liked. I learned binary when I was eight years old, and, and I just want to do this. Well, I started with a computer science degree and found out that I really didn't like coding. For yeah, I like to do it for fun, but I couldn't do it in the time frames that my professors wanted me to. And actually, one of my first professors said, 50% of you are going to fail my class, and in the next class, 50% of you are going to fail the class. And to me, I was like, OK, I think I can get through this. By the time I got to the second class, I didn't fail it. But I'm like, this is not for me. And so I actually switched and got a degree in accounting. It's kind of a big turnaround. But at the university I went to, there was two types of computer science degrees. There was the engineering degree, which means lots of math, which I am horrible at, which is funny that I got an accounting degree. Or you could do a business-focused computer science. And that you had to take accounting, economics. And I really enjoyed that. I had done it in high school. So that's the route I went. So what did I do with my accounting degree? I went and became an auditor. And everybody ran away from me um, out the door. And so I spent about 14 years as an auditor. Five of those were doing uh, financial records for government. And I'm like, I cannot work with numbers for the rest of my life. This is horrible. I'm dying here. And so we had an opportunity. Um, to go into the IT audit side of the house. And so I switched over. And I knew enough to be slightly dangerous. And I learned a little more. Um, but as an auditor, there's only so much you can do. You don't build systems. You don't design networks. You just go in and tell people how they did it wrong. And so I spent a lot of years telling people how, it, how they did it wrong. I left government, went into the private sector to a financial institution. And I decided, you know what? I really want to get out of audit. I, want to, I don't want to be the Darth Vader guy anymore. I don't want to be everybody's hated rag doll. I want to go into InfoSec, which probably is a slight step up, but I still get the, the leers in the, in the elevator. Oh, you're InfoSec. OK. Uh -huh. You're still not that OK. But in between then, I had a family. So I have four kids. If you got to see our talk yesterday, I gave a talk with my two oldest, Ghost Nomad Jr. and Knuckles over here. Um, I also have two others. I have a five-year-old. Or I'm sorry, six-year-old. He just turned six. And uh, my daughter is about to turn four. So I have three boys and a girl. And having kids 
is really interesting, especially when you're in information security, because you know everything that's bad, and you want to protect them from everything that's bad, but you also know that if you don't give them the tools to do what they need to do, they're just going to fail like everybody else does. So you got to give them the right tools and not just you know try to put them in a box and not let them do anything. And it was really my kids that inspired me to make, take this next step. And that was into information security because I said, you know what, I'm not real happy with being an auditor. And I'm probably getting more and more crabby as the years go on. And I don't want to be crabby with my kids. So let's go into InfoSec. Let's do something completely different, but still slightly the same. So now I shout out secure, secure, and everybody thinks I'm crazy like the rest of us. So how did I get the baking from security? Well, it started about a year and a half ago. Uh, New Year's Eve was rolling around, end of 2010. Everybody makes resolutions and, and everybody breaks. Usually it's I'm going to exercise. You buy the gym and you're there for months and all your money's gone. Well, my resolution was a little bit different. I was going to try to make one new recipe a week. Now, prior to this resolution, I could make brats on the grill, burgers on the grill, steak on the grill. I could do spaghetti, slightly OK. I could make chili. I could do tacos. I don't know if that's really baking or just throwing a bunch of stuff together. And that was pretty much, I could make cheesecake. That was, that was the one thing I learned when I was younger. That was about the extent of what I could make. And it drove my wife nuts. But I made the same thing every week. It was like, OK, tonight we're having this. Well, that's what we had last Monday. Well, that's what I know how to make. And so we started watching a lot of cooking shows. My kids started picking up on the cooking shows. Dad, you should be on Iron Chef. And yeah, no, I'm nowhere even close to that. But I decided, you know what? I can do this. I can learn something new every week. And I can challenge myself. And cooking, I think everyone thinks it's really hard. You know, there's, there's sometimes you look at these ingredients lists and it's like this long, and you're like, holy cow, how can I even do this? And you give up. You can start simple. But I think the one thing I wanted to do again was challenge myself. And that translates over to information security. If you think about what we do on a daily, if not weekly basis, is you're dealing with new threats all the time. And you have to be able to adapt and learn. And so really, the same mentality that I was going to try to learn a new recipe every week I also needed to take into my, my focus in information security. And really, any profession you do, you should always be looking at the new way you can do it. And so not only was I challenging myself to come up with a new recipe a week, and I'm not making the recipes. Don't get me wrong. I have no idea how to do that. I go on the internet. And actually, my favorite website is allrecipes.com. I find out everything I can get on that one. See another hand there? Yeah, it's great. I mean, you can find just about everything. And and the user ratings tell you uh, what not to try and, and what to try. All right, so while I talk, I'm going to attempt to make a carrot cake. All right, so I've given the ingredients list here up on the screen. It seems kind of a lot. Now, the bottom two are optional. I'm not crazy about nuts and the things I eat, and I terribly hate coconut, so I'm not going to use those. But if you were to attempt to try this, and um, you like walnuts or you like coconut, or feel free to add it to the cake. I think it tastes fine without it. There's a couple parts to this that we'll go through. But I think before I move into making it, when you talk about ingredients for a recipe, these are all the things you need to do. And as you get more comfortable with cooking, you'll find that there's things that you can tweak, you can change. You know, yesterday in one of the talks, they talked about hacking as a mentality across many things. It can be food hacking. It can toy hacking, game hacking last night. So at the same, in the same respect, you can, you can change what you put in. If you don't like cinnamon, if you're allergic to cinnamon, but you want to do something else like nutmeg that has flavor, you can make those modifications. And again, a lot of times in, in security, and again, I'm not an operational security guy. I'm more of a governing type of security role. But in, in what you do in information security, there's different ingredients. Sure, you can go get an off-the-shelf product pop it in and let it run. Just like you can go to the store, buy a pre-made pre pizza, throw it in the oven, and it's done. But you don't know what's in it. And actually, a lot of times you find out the, the food you buy at the store that's pre-processed, that's already made for you, isn't as healthy. And it's not as flavorful for you as if you make it yourself. And that could probably be said also about different products you buy. It's not always, it's not a one-fit product, right? 
so it's designed, but then you need to customize it for your organization. But if you don't know what's baked into it, how do you know how to modify it? How do you know how to change it? Unless somebody else has tried it, broke it sometimes, maybe not. And then sometimes it's better to take from scratch. So just like that, that pre-processed food in the store, and, and if anyone's a vendor in here, I'm not trying to offend you by saying your product's pre-processed food. I'm the least bit. But it, at the same time, when, when you, what you're looking for isn't necessarily already pre-made, baking it from scratch, finding those recipes, going out and digging and finding what you need to do to make it fit for your organization, it's the same thing. So you start with an ingredient list that somebody else has tried, but then you can start to tweak it, start to make those changes. So if you find a setting on, a, on one of your systems isn't working the way you thought, it's not giving you the alerts you want, it's not stopping something that you want it to stop, you go in and you fiddle around with it, you tweak it, and then you update the recipe and share it with other people. It's the same thing, that's what's great about all recipes. You don't have to, they encourage you to be a member, but you don't have to pay for it, it's all free. People are, are giving out these recipes. And in InfoSec, you can find the same thing. People share information. They want to help you learn so that you can do as just as good as they're doing. Um, so that said, I'm going to try to go through the timeline of baking. And really, you saw all those ingredients. It's boiled down to three steps. The first step is probably the easiest. You have to preheat your oven. Now, of course, you have to know what your oven is. You have to know which dial turns on your oven and which dial turns on the, the, the top burners. Turn on the top burners and you reach over, you're going to burn yourself. So there is some chance of error. Again, sometimes the easiest steps in information security can also be the most harmful. Um, so first you're going to preheat your oven to 375. I have my trusty, magical, easy-bake oven. It is already at 375. I know it. It's, it's perfect. It's all ready to go. So I just have to mix up these ingredients. Now, from that ingredient list, there's two more steps. The first step, we're going to mix flour, baking soda, baking powder, salt, and cinnamon. So I already have these pre-measured out. So what we have here is baking soda. Now, I do make some cookies. At one time, I put baking soda in. Uh, baking, it called for baking powder, and I put in baking soda. The cookies were flat and tasted horribly bitter. So these mistakes, they can, they can really bite you. And same with thing with information security. If you're not careful, you know, you put in the wrong ingredient, you're going to get the wrong result. And you're going to know it pretty quickly. Uh, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll think, oh, yeah, I did this right. And then down the road, you're like looking at the recipe again. And you're like, oh, I was supposed to use that and not that. Hmm. And then you make it, it tastes a little better. So sometimes it's not as evident. This is the baking powder. So we're using both baking powder and baking soda. So you can't mess that up on this recipe. I'm going to add the cinnamon. This is where you get your flavor. Again, if you're allergic to any of these ingredients, these will be in the final product. So don't taste it because I don't want you to have to go to the hospital. But cinnamon. And then. We have our two and a half cups of flour. I'm going to try not to make a mess up here. And I seem to be missing my salt. Oh, it's right here. OK, so this is what's called the dry ingredient. OK, so that's the first step. Usually when you're baking something, breads, desserts like this that, that need to rise, these are your dry ingredients. So they always tell you to mix them up. So what we're going to need to do, just to get everything mixed through, we're going to take our spatula, get it all mixed around. All right, making a bit of a mess. So you can see everything's kind of speckled through. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the cinnamon's kind of speckled through everything. Everything's nice and mixed up. So that's our first step. And a lot of times, a lot of the dry ingredients and in information security is those dry things we have to do. The research, you know, you got to go out and you have to find these things. It takes hours. I think somebody mentioned yesterday, a lot of times you want to get down to the stuff that's the cool stuff, but it, usually 90% of what you do is the really boring stuff. So the boring stuff is your dry ingredients. 
you've got to put them together. Now, when I'm baking at home, I always have my cell phone out because that's where I have all my recipes on. And I don't care how many times I've made this carrot cake since I first started this process, I have to look at the recipe every time. I don't know why, I have this mental block. There's a few recipes I can do without that. And sometimes when I do try that, I mess it up terribly. Um, again, in information security or in any job, you try to go through the steps because you think you got them down. You don't go back to the source of how, you, how you're supposed to do that, and you mess it up. And then you got to go back, tear everything down, go through the steps again to make sure you did it right. So it's not always a bad thing to have to look at the recipe and the ingredients over and over because it reminds you what you're supposed to do. Um, but at the same time, as you get more comfortable, you can do some of the steps on your own. All right. Step three. This is kind of a big combination. So even though I call it one step, this is combining <coughs> into the, the wet mixture. So first we're going to take our sugar. This is the part we all like, right, the sugar. That's what, that's what we're all here for. Give us some boost. What's that? that yeah, yeah, that and fat. That's right. Fat in, in, in limited quantities is great. You know, gives it gives it the content. All right. Now, oil. When I put this oil in with the sugar, it's gonna look really gross. And actually when then I add the eggs, it's gonna look terribly gross. Don't be afraid of how things look when you're putting them together. Because oftentimes the end result is fantastic. And again, because this is baking in security. That's going to happen too. You're going to be putting things together. It's going to look terribly difficult. It's not going to look pretty. But by the end of it, you're going to get there, and it's going to work properly. So we've got the oil and the sugar. Now we need the eggs right here in front of me. Now, <clears throat> this is probably the hardest step, cracking the egg and not getting the shell in there. Always have a spoon ready to get it out. Because if, you've ever cr if you haven't cracked an egg, this may be new to you. If you've cracked an egg and you've had this, an eggshell inside of an egg white is almost impossible to get a hold of. As soon as you stick your finger in that egg white, it shoots off. It's, it's like trying to catch a greased pig probably. I've never done that, but it probably is. Um, and so always have a spoon handy or just make sure that you're really good at cracking eggs. So oops, I did it without getting the shell. That's two, it takes four eggs. So it's four times the chance of really screwing up. No shell. And a big shell. All right. All right, so that's what you can do. You can get a shell in there. And that's not going to taste very good if you get it in there. Again, if you mess up what you're doing, you're going to wind up with something that's going to kick out. You're going to get an alert in your system. Where you're like, whoa, what's this? But it's not really anything. It was just junk you left over. So you got to make sure you get all the junk out. Only leave the ingredients you want. Now, we have to mix these together. And then we're going to add the carrots. Huh. I forgot a step. That's funny. So, a little QA. Can anybody find what I was missing? I probably wasn't up there enough. Yeah. No, got the eggs. Yep, pineapple. So, if you're using my slides to make this, don't. I'll try to fix it beforehand, but when you add the carrots, you also add the pineapple. So first you have to mix the eggs, the oil, and the sugar together, and that's always a fun job. You can use a mixer. I tend to like to do it by hand, but then again, I like to do stuff on my own anyways. Um, how, much, how many of us are scratch your own itch type of people where you don't get something and you're like, I'm just gonna do it myself because I know if I try it something, some other person's way, it's not gonna do what I want it to do. Same thing. All right, that's nice and mixed together. We're going to put that over here. Now, 
carrot. You can buy the pre-shredded carrot. Personally, I like to shred my own carrots. This is the second most dangerous thing. The first one, if you eat a shell, it's not going to taste very good and it gets stuck in your throat, scratch up your throat, end up packing up. It's not pleasant. Shredding carrots, you could shred your finger with the carrot. So you got to be careful. My advice, when you get down to the little nub of the carrot, don't fry it because your finger is going to come off with the carrot. So we're going to shred this. It goes pretty fast. The other trick I found when you're, when you're shredding something yourself, as it starts to get angled, turn it, it shreds a little easier. And again, these are the tricks. You know, it's not just baking. It's anything you do in life. You find those little tricks. Yeah, I'm going to stop now because I'm sure you don't want my finger in what you eat. Um, but you find those little tricks that make things a lot easier to do, right? So, hey, if you do it this way, you're not going to run into all these problems. So same thing. So we shred the carrot. All right, we're going to stop there. Okay, now, we've got our shredded carrots. Actually, it tastes more than what I'm doing, but for the sake of time, my magic Easy Bake Oven is going to add the carrots that we need. I pre-programmed it. I've hacked the Easy Bake Oven. It's going to do it. So I shredded carrots, two and a half cups, like the recipe said. So we're going to add this to the, the wet ingredients, mix that in. It's looking a little better. And we have our pineapple. Use crushed. If you really like pineapple, you can use um, chunks if you prefer. I'm not a big pineapple person. So the recipe calls for the um, crushed pineapple. And as a non-pineapple person, I actually can, can stomach it. So it actually tastes pretty good. If you don't like pineapple, give it a try because you probably won't taste it that much. This is actually, between the carrots and the pineapple and the sugar, is really what adds the sweetness to it. And the title of this recipe is Moist Carrot Cake. If you try it without the pineapple, it's probably going to end up dry. So if you, if you want another moist carrot cake that doesn't have the pineapple, there's probably another recipe out there to find. But I would recommend using the pineapple um, because otherwise it's going to end up dry. All right, and then we mix this up. And then we take our dry ingredients and we're going to mix them in. Now they, they do what they call folding. Now if you haven't cooked before, I'll show you what that means. If you have, bear with me. So you pour a little bit in and then you literally take your spatula and you fold it over. Right? That helps get all that wet and dry mix together. Don't do too much at one time because it's going to end over your table. As soon as you start stirring, it's just going to flop right out. So we're going to add it. Mix it around. And so we're, we're coming into the final stages here. And again, this is where you're tweaking your systems. This is where you're really getting your stuff in order, ready to bake. And by bake, I mean put it into production. It's looking, starting to look more like what you're going to want to eat. Um, not quite, but it's just about there. second here. Getting it all in there. And now instead of having this orangish, yellowish goop, you wind up with brownish, orangish, yellowish, whitish goop. And you're going to want to make sure the last step is pour it into a pan. If you pour it right into the pan, if you have a nonstick pan, that's great. If you don't, you need to spray the pan or grease it or whatever you're going to do because you're going to have a heck of a time getting this thing out of the pan without that. So again, those last minute things you do in putting in your, your security, you, you need to make sure that you've checked all the boxes and dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's because if you haven't, and you get something into place, it starts running and it's really messed up, it could take a, a lot of hard work to get it back out. So you wanna make sure that you've done all your steps and you've made it 
the, the system nice and greased to put it right in there. And we're going to put this in our easy bake oven. I'll turn it around so I can magically put it in there. Pay no attention to the man behind the mat or the curtain. And what we end up with, it also chills on demand. So this is nice and chilled too. Our finished product is this nice carrot cake. Now, you'll notice something. There's frosting on the top. You can frost it with anything. My favorite frosting is a very versatile frosting. It's a, it's a um, cream cheese based frosting. And literally what you do is you take two eight ounce packages of, of cream cheese, one stick of butter, because we all love to eat butter, add two cups of our favorite thing, powdered sugar, and then I think it's a teaspoon, I don't know, I just kind of pour it in, uh, do vanilla. Those four simple ingredients. You mix them together, and I think they taste fantastic. If you're not a cream, the funny thing is, is when I first made this cream cheese frosting, I didn't make it for this. I made it for red velvet cupcakes, which my kids absolutely love. And then I decided to try to make crepes. And we actually had those this morning for breakfast. Um, and take the crepe, put the frosting in there, put some fruit in there, wrap it up. And of course, what do you have to do? You have to put the maple syrup on top, so you got the sugar and the sugar and the sugar and the natural sugar, and it, it's it's like heaven, as my son says. Um, and so, literally, I've just showed you how to bake a carrot cake, and I've talked about a little bit about security. But more importantly, I think when people say baking and security, and you think, okay, we gotta we gotta insert security into the development process. But when you go and you actually bake. And you understand, what does it mean if I don't put the salt in? Or what does it mean if I mess up and I put baking powder instead of baking soda? When you, when you actually physically bake something, and you realize what it means to forget that ingredient, and you see the impact, sometimes you're able to better understand and better able to communicate that back to others as to what baking insecurity means and why that is so important. And so probably the question on everyone's mind right now is, so I made this resolution to do a new recipe every week for a year. Did I actually stick to it? And the answer is yes. The first year I made 86 new recipes. So I should have done 52, I did 86. They weren't all massive things. One of them was the cream cheese frosting. You may say, well, how's that a recipe? Well, it is. I mean, we have little things in our system, and we have big things in our system. And each one requires some attention. So it's important that you try not only to do these big, massive things, but also to do the little things. Because sometimes when you do the little things, and you mix them with the big things, you end up with something like this, which is a carrot cake with a nice cream cheese frosting. Um, and so that's what, and not only did I do that last year, but I decided again to do it this year. And so I'm still baking, I'm still cooking. I, it's more than baking. Um, one of my favorite recipes, and I never knew it existed, and I'm probably going to to not say it right, is it, if you like pasta and you like bacon, you really should try this. It's called Amatrishana. Now, I've seen it once on the Cooking Channel since, and they use prosciutto instead of bacon, but I'm not fancy like that, so I just go out and get really thick bacon. But you literally take bacon. I use a pound. They call for three strips, I think, in the recipe on allrecipes.com. Um, I use an entire pound. And you render the bacon, you get it nice and crispy, you pull it out, you throw garlic and onions in there, and then once that's got nice and, and soft, about three to five minutes, you throw in a couple cans of stewed tomatoes, you let that simmer for a few minutes, you crush those stewed tomatoes, um, you add, you leave in the bacon, obviously. After about 20 minutes, when it started to simmer down, you make some fettuccine noodles, dump those in there, mix it up, add some crushed red pepper. And usually I put sugar in my spaghetti sauce. This does not need sugar because the sweet and smoky flavor from the, from the bacon, it, it's fantastic. Now, if you leave too much bacon fat in there, it'll get really greasy and it does not taste good. So um, the recipe does tell you to take most of the bacon fat out. I probably take about half of it out. You, know, you got to get it to the right, right place you like. But again, there's these things that I never would have thought of trying. I've never even had in a restaurant, and I've only heard once otherwise. But if you just go out and try them, and, and you're willing to try them, they taste pretty good. And again, 
you're going to hear things about different uh, technologies and security that you maybe would never try, never think about. But if you just go out and try it, or try building it yourself and, and seeing if you can understand how it works, you may find that the end product you get is much better than you ever expected. And so I did. I made it a full year. I'm now four months into my second resolution and still making new things. Um, but again, I'm shouting out security all the time. And so I try to, again, take what I've learned from baking and cooking and, and use that to better relate to people who aren't security related or aren't technical in nature. You know, because a lot of times we want to throw out terms. And, and you, know, you hear all the time that security people don't know how to communicate to business people. And so really, if you start to try to learn something different and different ways of doing it, sometimes you find better ways to communicate. I did that two years ago when I started writing haiku. I found a better way to communicate very complex issues simply. And last year I wrote a book about it. So um, do, I, do I write technically correct haiku? No. The technically correct haiku has certain parameters. I follow the, the uh, syllables, but I don't follow certain other rules. But I call it haiku because it's fun. So you learn different ways to communicate by doing different things. You also learn what it means to actually bake something in, as opposed to just telling people, we need to bake in security. So I think, ultimately, baking and security can blend. Just the same way that any other professions, if you learn from one, you can take it to the other. The things I learned when I was in construction, I brought with me into auditing, and thus into security. Um, even different life experiences, going back to how I got from where I am today, you know, to the, from the beginning to now. I think about when I used to work in retail um, in the um, stock room, I saw a lot of breaches of physical security where people would take broken products and stick them on the dock for their, their friends to take. So I saw in a very real sense as a younger person that physical security, the, the need for asset control. And at the time, I wasn't thinking, oh, yeah, this is what I want to do with, with the rest of my life. The same way that they put up security cameras in stores, but it can't see everything because of shelves and the way they stack. So they actually have to have people out on the floor to, to observe those areas that are blind to cameras. It's the same thing. We can't just put a product in in security and say we're secure. We need to have the people there also be looking at it. And that's when you get those three process, the people, process, and technology when you talk about security. You really need all three because each one helps complement the other. And so the same way that we, we deal with that, I think baking can definitely teach us a lot about security. So if you have any questions, you feel free to ask them now. Again, I'm at Ghost Nomad on Twitter. If you want to email me, I'm ghostnomad at ghostnomad.com. If you want to see any of the haiku, it's it-haiku.com. I do try to. I haven't been as good writing haiku or blog posts. Um, I'm going to try to take a lot of this, a lot of the recipes I've tried, and at least provide the links at ghostnomad.com. So probably over the next month, you'll see a lot of this stuff start to pop up. Any other questions? Any questions? That's a good question. Um, one recently, actually I made it last week, I've, I'm not a vegetable person. I don't know if any of us like our vegetables. Maybe I'm just weird. But I would never have tried Brussels sprouts. Um, and my wife, yeah, that's, that's the same reaction I have. Ooh, Brussels sprouts. You know, you, and my wife found a recipe in her magazine, ripped it out, set it over, and it was called um, Sweet Chili Vinegar Brussels Sprouts. Okay, I, I don't like vinegar. I don't put vinegar on my fries. I'm not a, that's not me. But I'm like, okay, I'll make it for you. So you, what you do is you just cover the Brussels sprouts in a little bit of olive oil and salt, throw it in the oven for, I did it for 30 minutes. It did a little too much. So probably in my oven down to 25 minutes. And then you take a cup of sugar, a cup of vinegar, get that mixed in, crushed red pepper, Getting something in there. Oh, garlic. 
put that in there, and you, you let that simmer, and it actually smells like sweet and sour sauce. It's clear, so it's almost like a vinaigrette, but it's sweet and sour. Put it on the Brussels sprouts. I have never tasted something that I, a vegetable that I thought was so good. So that was a pleasant surprise to me, um, that vegetables taste so good. It was um, sweet chili vinegar Brussels sprouts. First thing I ever cooked for the resolution. Yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> I, th I think it was a broccoli cheese soup. Yeah, And that's the funny thing is a lot of stuff that I've cooked, I don't like. I don't like seafood, and I've cooked um, crab cakes. I've cooked, I've, I've learned how to properly cook scallops. Um, I don't like mushrooms, but I, I make a mushroom um, risotto. I just get out the mushrooms. It's actually pretty good. And then you and, and one of the one of the derivatives of that is I, I this is where I branched out. I took some scallops, um, cooked it with andouille sausage, and crush, uh, squeezed a lemon over top of it. And both the andouille and the scallops were phenomenal because that, that lemon just kind of crystallizes right on it. And you put that over top of the, the mushroom risotto, it's fantastic. And again, risotto, I, I watched um, some of the cooking shows, and, and I'm like, that's fancy. It, t it takes a lot of work. It's actually pretty easy. I mean, you just kind of throw the ingredients in and let it simmer for 30 to 40 minutes, and voila, you've got it. So I think it was broccoli cheese soup, but I'm not sure. Any other questions? That's, that's a good question. Um, it actually came from when I was auditing. I was trying to find a handle to go by. And so my first Yahoo email account was um, Ghost Audit. And I'm like, oh, I really don't want audit in my name. And then I thought about it because I was working for the state. I was traveling to clients. And I'm like, you know, I'm kind of a nomad. So that's Ghost Nomad because I'm never really around the clients, but I'm always there. So that's kind of where that came from. Anything else? Yeah, we can eat the cake. Nobody asked me the important question, though. Which recipe went horribly wrong? Because that's, pro that's probably the most you learn is when it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> we were on vacation last summer, and my kids wanted queso. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I searched everywhere for good queso recipes. Couldn't find it. Like, I can do this on my own. Go out. I got, I think, two pounds of cheddar cheese. I had garlic powder. I had all this stuff. Threw it all in. I didn't know anything about working with um, jalapenos, serranos, poblano peppers. You know, so I, I actually probably did the wrong thing. And I, some may say I did the right thing. But I took out all the seeds and just used the peppers, right? Because I'm thinking, oh, the peppers is what's hot. It's, it's actually not. It's the seeds. Um, threw all this stuff in through garlic powder. And the kids were asleep when I finally finished it. And my wife and I tasted it, and I almost threw up. It was horrible. Don't ever add garlic powder to queso, because it's just not meant to be in there. Um, as a, I, I recently, my son, um, had given up eating chips for a while. And I make some soft pretzels. And he's like, I want to eat queso with the soft pretzels. I'm like, OK, I'm going to do this. So I got on. And the actual the most simple recipe for queso that I found is, as much as it sounds sounded gross to me at the time is you take a, a small block of Velveeta cheese, melt it down, throw in some serranos and poblanos and uh, um, jalapenos. I cut about half to three-fourths of the seeds out because they don't want that too hot, but it's still pretty good. And then you just take a can of fire-roasted, like a 10-ounce, 12-ounce can of fire-roasted uh, diced tomatoes, throw it in there. It's fantastic. We five things. Yes. First time cake I well that goes back to before I started this, which was cheesecake. This is my favorite. So anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna cut this magic cake. And if you want some you can come up and have it. And if you have any other questions, again feel free to contact me or hit me up in the hallway.